It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, who's Aaron Collins. Aaron is a grad student who's working in and he is originally from New Hampshire and got his undergraduate degree in chemistry from the University of Connecticut and then came to Arizona State University as a graduate student in chemistry and uh, shortly after uh, he arrived there and joined my group I announced that I was moving to WashU and uh, fortunately Aaron decided to move with me and has now finished his uh, thesis work and is about to um, defend his thesis on Thursday <clears throat> and so uh, everything's all coming to a head at the at the end here. Um, and then uh, a little later this summer, Aaron is going west and he will take up a postdoc position at uh, Sandia National Lab with Jerry Timlin, who's also one of our uh, park affiliates. And so he's going to stay uh, a little bit uh, close to home, at least uh, maybe not geographically, but, uh, but uh, philosophically. Um, so Aaron is going to tell us about his uh, uh, some of his thesis research that uh, relates to Park. He has other things that he's uh, been that he has done for his thesis that are not really in the scope of Park, but uh, he's going to talk about the Park-related uh, aspects of it today. So Aaron, thank you very much. We appreciate you. You're the first student presenter. Thank you, thank you. Could you do a quick test to make sure everyone can hear? Are we good all around? All right, thank you. Um, today I'd like to tell you, as Bob mentioned, about the park related portions of my dissertation, which are uh, a model of the light harvesting apparatus in Rosia flexus catapultii. And so here's an overview of my talk today. I'd like to spend a little bit of time with an introduction, getting everyone familiar with pigments and transition dipoles. I'd like to spend some time talking about antenna diversity that we see in nature, and then introduce the light harvesting apparatus among filamentous and oxygenic phototropes, and then introduce the organism I work almost exclusively, exclusively with, which is Rosiflexus castamultii. We'll then switch gears and talk almost exclusively about spectroscopy and how we can use spectroscopy to determine things such as pigment orientation, orientation in the light harvesting antenna. Uh, briefly mention some experiments where we determine the size of the photosynthetic antenna, my experiences with the Park Scientific Exchange, and leave you with the model for the photosystem in this organism. So we can start with pigments which are central to antenna um, complexes, and this is bacteria chlorophyll A on the right, and on the left we have its absorption properties in organic solvent. We can see from the absorption profile that there are three prominent transitions which span from about 350 to 770 nanometers. We can represent these transitions very crudely with simple homo lumo diagrams, where the lowest energy transition uh, would occur at the longest wavelength. This is known as the QI transition. Uh, being a dipole, it means the transition is polarized, so it has directionality in the molecule. And it's thought uh, that these transitions occur between the nitrogens, nitrogens that are bridge ring uh, one and ring three for the QI transition. For the QX transition, this is occurring crudely from the HOMO minus one to LUMO level. And this occurs between the nitrogens of ring two and ring four within the molecular framework. Being a slightly higher energy transition, it occurs at shorter wavelengths, right around 600 nanometers. And lastly, the Sare region is mixed contributions from the HOMO and HOMO minus one to the LUMO level, uh, occurring within this uh, molecular framework as well. Not all organisms use bacteria chlorophyll. In fact, uh, higher plants and cyanos use chlorophyll. And it's a very subtle change in this ring system where we introduce a vinyl group here at the C3 position as well as a double bond at the 7 8 position in the structure. This subtle change blue shifts the QI transition by about 100 nanometers. So we can see that nature will develop uh, a diverse set of pigments in order to harvest light of various qualities and quantities. <coughs> I think this can be illustrated here by taking the absorption profiles of several natural photosynthetic antennas. On the top, we have some representatives from the bacterial lineage of photosynthesis, such as the FMO protein, which is found in green sulfur bacteria, 
as well as the RCLH1 and LH2 complex, which I'll talk about today from purple bacteria. Transitioning to eukaryotes, we can see not all antennas are chlorophyll-based, such as the PCP protein, which uses large amounts of carotenoid, or uh, open-chain tetraparoles in phycobilosomes, represented here by phycocyanin. In addition to that, we have the standard PS1 and PS2 complexes. We can see from this graph that almost all of the light between 300 and about 900 nanometers can be utilized by different antenna complexes. However, all these antenna complexes function under the same accord, and that's to harvest light energy and deliver that energy to a reaction center where photochemistry takes place. And for my talk today, we'll be talking almost exclusively about this portion of these two reactions. <clears throat> If we look at the distribution or the phylogeny among photosynthetic bacteria, our group has been focusing in for a while now on the filamentous anoxygenic phototrophs. One of the reasons why we're interested in this group, as you can see from this tree, is that they're the first branching group that contains phototrophs. So they may be vestige to some of the earliest photosynthesizers. If we focus in and look at the antenna system among green filamentous anoxygenic phototrophs, this has been typified primarily by a species known as Chloroplexus orantiacus, which was discovered in the early 1970s. Organisms like Chloroplexus um, brought a lot of interest due to the fact that they contain a very unique antenna complex known as chlorosomes. They can be seen here in the freeze fracture micrograph from spray as these sort of ellipsoidal bodies which are attached to the cytoplasmic base of the membrane. Chlorosomes are remarkable and could probably warrant their own park talk, but I won't be talking more about them today other than this slide. Uh, they're quite enormous. They can be about 200 nanometers long, uh, about 40 nanometers in diameter, and only about 20 to 30 nanometers in height. Uh, with dimensions like that, one can estimate that there's approximately 50,000 bacteria chlorophyll C uh, inside each one of these chlorosomes, and that uh, there's a homolog distribution of the bacteria chlorophyll C where they are sterified with tails such as geranyl geraniol, 9 octadecanol, and octadecanol. What we think the uh, model of the photosynthetic system in FAPs which contain chlorosomes is illustrated here on the bottom right. We envision that there is a large chlorosome attached to the cytoplasmic membrane. It's coupled to a membrane embedded antenna known as the B808866 complex which is named for the absorption properties in the QI region of this antenna species. And that this B808866 complex is coupled to a reaction center. If we were to look at simply isolated membranes from this species, chloroplexus, we can see that it's dominated by a large absorption peak at 740 nanometers. This comes from the bacteria chlorophyll C found in the chlorosome. Now one of my interests and part of my uh, research in Bob's group has been to try to understand what is the membrane portion of this complex looks like. So you can imagine working with an organism such as chloroflexus that circumventing the large chlorosome can be quite a challenge. If you want to study this system optically, almost any photon you would shine on this system could be absorbed by the chlorosome. In addition to that, purifying the membrane components can be very challenging as well due to the fact that there always seems to be some residual bacteria chlorophyll C remaining. And so we were very fortunate that while uh, a little bit before I joined Bob's group, there was the discovery of the organism I work on, Rosiflexus castamultii, which is a filamentous anoxygenic phototroph that does not contain chlorosomes. So it affords us the advantage to study the membrane components in an FAP without the complications of the said chlorosome. So these are some images from the initial description paper by Hanada and coworkers. Um, it was originally isolated in 2002 from a hot spring in Japan, and in figure A from their paper, uh, the hot spring is actually located kind of up in this top panel. This is a retaining concrete wall where nutrient-rich water would sort of seep and spill over the wall, and they found a very rich, a very rich ecological uh, microbial community growing on the wall. Uh, and that's illustrated here in, in panel B. A cartoon of what the microbial mat is is in the lower right. Um, and what was found is that three independent species were growing in symbiosis with one another. These include cyanobacteria, chloroflexus-like species, and then the newly discovered roseoflexus species. And it was a really beautiful system because the cyanobacteria were harvesting light from about 600 to 700 nanometers, leaving a gap from about 700 to 800 for the chloroflexus species, 
to utilize. And then the rosy flicks of species were absorbing the light beyond 800, up to about 900 nanometers. So we can see from this, by, by having a variation in the antenna complexes within these species, uh, that each organism can thrive in its own individual light environment. So we obtained a uh, cell culture from Don Bryant's group and started growing it in the lab. And these are just some general features of the organism itself. Uh, as I mentioned before, it is a filamentous anoxygenic phototroph. It's a moderate thermophile. We grow it at about 55 degrees in the lab. Uh, it forms these beautiful spaghetti noodles, which are unbranched multicellular filaments uh, of an of indefinite length, but about a micron in diameter. We find that the organism is fully pigmented whether we grow it photosynthetically, anaerobically, or chemotrophically in the dark in the presence of oxygen. There's no observed photoautotrophy in this organism, so it doesn't fix carbon dioxide. And it contains bacteria chlorophyll A and several different carotenoids, which I'll talk about. In the lower left, this is an image from our fermenter with about 14 liters of rosy flexus growing uh, quite happily. So I'll, I'll spare you the details on, on how we go ahead and, and purify the various complexes from rosia flexus, but I will tell you that we can purify a full complement of complexes from the organism itself. This includes the core complex, or the light harvesting reaction center complex here in red. We can purify the antenna only complex, which lacks the reaction center. And then lastly, we can purify the reaction center. On the right, this is an SBS page gel just showing the composition of the subunits from each of these complexes. For the LH only complex, there's only two polypeptides which have been identified. These are known as the alpha and beta polypeptides. They have, outside of FAPs, their greatest similarity to purple bacteria. Within the reaction center, there are predominantly three uh, subunits as well. These include a cytochrome subunit, which is called the C subunit and then two smaller subunits known as the L and M, again, outside of FAPs having greatest similarity to the purple bacteria. Um, so today I would like to use LH1 and LH2 from purple bacteria as sort of model systems because we have structural information from X-ray crystallography studies and a wealth of spectroscopic data. So we can link the structure to the function as well as the spectroscopy. Uh, here in the top left, we have LH2, uh, sort of top-down view and then a side view of the complex. There are two rings of um, subunits in this complex, an inner ring of alpha subunits here in, I guess this is showing up as purple, and an outer ring here in red of beta subunits. Sandwiched in between these two are two rings of vector chlorophyll molecules. Um, nine of them are represented here. It might be a little bit hard to see. Uh, nine principally monomeric vector chlorophyll molecules, which are responsible for the absorption band in the QI region at about 800 nanometers. In addition to that, there's 18 tightly coupled pigments residing in this upper ring here, which are responsible for the redshift in this band to about 850 nanometers. If we compare that to the LH1 complex, there's only one band observed in the absorption profile. It can vary between about uh, 700, 870 to about 880 nanometers if it contains bacteria chlorophyll A. In addition to that, we see some similarity. We see that there's an inner ring of alpha polypeptides, an outer ring of beta polypeptides, and then the sandwich again of the chlorophyll molecules in between. The center of this complex is the reaction center. If we overlay this with um, the LHRC from Rosia Flexus Casamolskii, what we see is two bands in the um, QI region, one at about 800 nanometers and one at about 880 nanometers. So from just a first approximation, we can see there's some similarity between both complexes, both LH1 and LH2. And we'd like to know, well, what does the structure of this complex look like? So we'll build up from the primary sequence. Rosia flexus has, has had its genome sequence, so we know the alpha and beta polypeptide sequence from the gene products. If we compare them to LH2 alpha subunit from acidophila, which is corresponding to the LH2 structure that was on the previous slide, um, we can see that there's a conserved transmembrane region. This was predicted using uh, readily available uh, transmembrane algorithms that you can find on the uh, internet, as well as comparing it to what's known from the crystal structure. Uh, this region is fairly highly conserved in the prediction. I illustrate it here with this uh, helical cartoon. In addition to that, 
Uh, histidine, which is known to centrally coordinate one of the bacterial chlorophyll molecules, is conserved in this organism as well, in rosy plexus. If we also compare this now to the LH1 complexes from the sequence alone, again, we see a high level of conservation around the histidine, which we label zero. Again, this histidine is responsible for coordinating the bacterial chlorophyll molecule, as well as several other regions which have a fair bit of homology. So from the primary sequence level, we can see that there is similarity to both LH2 and LH1. And from this, uh, we, we can sort of suggest that there might be a B850 or 880-like set of bacterial chlorophylls. Uh, we could repeat this for the beta subunit, but it's really not necessary. We see the same trend, that there's similarity to both uh, LH2 and LH1 um, amino acid sequences. So after we can purify the complex, one of the first things we did was uh, extract all the pigments from it and actually try to identify um, what pigments were in the LHRC complex. Uh, using very crude extinction coefficients, we can estimate that there's about three bacterial chlorophyll molecules for every two carotenoids. And of the carotenoids, we get a very uh, broad distribution, mainly being derivatives of gamma carotene here on the top, but also a very strange carotenoid known as methoxyketomizogoxanthin. Uh, these all separate quite nicely under HPLC conditions, and their ratio can change depending whether we grow the cells aerobically or anaerobically and then purify the complexes from them. All right, so we'll talk now about some steady state optical properties of the complex itself. All of these experiments were done in a cryostat at 77K because you can get a lot more electronic structure. A lot of the bands sharpen up when you work at low temperature. There's a single emission band from this complex regardless of the excitation wavelengths we choose. It occurs at about 910 nanometers. What this means is if you were to shine light in the carotenoid region or the bacterial chlorophyll region, that excitation is rapidly transferred to the uh, long wavelength band at 880 nanometers. A fraction of that is lost as fluorescence. That's what we observe in this experiment. Well, the rest is most likely trapped by the reaction center. If we sit on that emission band and actually do an excitation measurement, we can calculate the efficiencies of energy transfer from the different regions of the complex. For example, the carotenoid region uh, transfers excitation to the long wavelength band with only about 35% energy transfer efficiency. Uh, however, all of the bacterial chlorophyll A in this complex, in the QX region or even in the Saray region, transfers with about 100% transfer efficiency. So this may indicate that all of those carotenoids, which we were able to identify previously, may be serving a more structural role, although it's all kind of a hypothesis at this point. We just know that that energy transfer is quite low. If we repeat the excitation measurement, where we determine the efficiency here, but we can put some polarizers in the excitation and emission beam path. We can do an experiment known as anisotropy. How anisotropy works is basically anytime there's a change in the transition dipole, you will lose anisotropy. Uh, so if that's a little bit confusing, one way to think about it is anytime uh, you have a very positive value for an anisotropy measurement, uh, it means your emitting dipole and whatever transferred energy to that emitting dipole are nearly parallel. The more negative this value is, the more that angle has rotated, okay? And so you can actually, from this experiment, calculate the angles of the dipoles responsible uh, for this trace. But most important from this experiment, we were able to determine that the band at 590, uh, which is clearly negative, is the QX band of the pigments absorbing at 880 nanometers. And that's because, if you remember back to one of the first slides we presented, QX and QY transitions should be approximately 90 degrees to one another. And so wherever you have the biggest difference in anisotropy, you'd expect the angle between those two dipoles to be the greatest. Uh, and that's going to be very important because we next performed an experiment known as linear dichroism. And it's uh, good to know those transitions for building a model of the antenna organization. So for an LD experiment, uh, there's several ways to do it. But one way to do it is to cast your complex into an acrylamide gel, and then compress that gel. You can imagine that when you solidify the, the gel in the, in the absence of compression, all of the complexes are going to be randomly oriented in the gel. However, when you compress the gel, uh, all of the pores in which the, the complexes are um, embedded 
will sort of reorient themselves in a way to minimize that pressure that you're putting on the gel, in this case along, along this axis. This is illustrated here in this cartoon, where you can see all of these discs are sort of randomly oriented. Uh, but upon compression, they get partial orientation. Once the gel is partially oriented, you can probe the gel using linearly polarized light. And you can do this experiment in a standard UV vis spectrometer with an additional uh, with an additional polarizer. And so in red, this is the LB measurement, the difference between light which is parallel and perpendicular to the stretching axis, the axis in which the gel has elongated. What we can see from this quite clearly is that there's a very, very good agreement between the absorption here in black and the 880 nanometer pigments uh, being most positive. What this indicates is that these transitions, this uh, transition dipole is going to be oriented more or less in the plane of these disks, if we can relate it to this uh, disk structure. All of the other transitions are primarily negative, meaning that they're going to be forming large angles with respect to this uh, symmetry axis, is how it's defined. Now, uh, the dotted line here should be at zero, and this sort of represents the magic angle, so any value below um, this dotted line will be an angle, a transition dipole, which should be lower than about 55 degrees, and anything above this would be closer to 90 degrees. If we compare this to uh, what I can find in the literature, this is from Theosperilla Malesianum's LH2 complex. We can see actually that the LD, which is in the dotted line, is very similar to the complex, the LHRC complex that we measured here in red, with the exception of the 800 nanometer band. We can see it's clearly positive in the case of this LH2 complex, and clearly negative in the case of our complex. That tells us that this transition is going to be oriented very differently. Now, because um, we want to actually be quantitative with this, uh, we can relate the LD to transition dipoles here, which is alpha, and by definition, it's with respect to the normal of the membrane plane, you can think of it that way. And in this case, we need to take into consideration an orientation factor. We can't orient the gel perfectly. The complexes will never orient in a uniform way. But we can circumvent that because if you remember, there was a great, uh, very good agreement with positive LD in the transition band at 880 nanometers. So using that, we can actually normalize all of the data by assuming that that transition can be normalized to say 90 or even 80 degrees with respect to the normal of the membrane plane. And then calculate all the rest of the transition dipoles from that. When we do that, we see that there's a very good uh, agreement with all of the other transitions, regardless of whether we pick 90 or 80 degrees. And from the polarization measurements, we can identify what is the QX and QY transition each set of bacteria chlorophyll molecules. So putting that all together, we can actually come up with kind of a crude subunit model for how these pigments should be oriented in space. We propose that the pigments responsible for the absorption at 880 nanometers are going to be more or less um, vertical in the plane of the membrane or the plane of the complex, with their QI transitions more or less in the plane of the membrane, here indicated in red. While the B800 pigments are going to be oriented at a large angle. We can also calculate from that experiment the orientation of the carotenoid molecule, but I omit it here because I'm not quite sure where to put it in relation to these two other pigments. If we go back to that structure from Phaeosporillum Malesianum, crystal structure, we can see that actually these two complexes, the LHRC and the LH2 from this complex, have very good agreement between either their 850 nanometer absorbing pigments or their 880 nanometer absorbing pigments with the big difference being the pigments absorbing at 880, 800 nanometers. Excuse me. We can see that in this complex, they're more or less at a large angle. And in the case of Malesianum, it's almost flat in the membrane. So after we had, um, excuse me for a moment. After we had this idea of what the subunit composition was and the orientation of these pigments, we wanted to look at what was the hydrogen bonding of these pigments as well. Uh, to do this, resonance Raman is a very suitable technique. Uh, you could imagine, so here again is bacteria chlorophyll A. You could imagine that this... Okay, thank you. Okay. You could imagine that in a bacteria chlorophyll molecule, all of these groups off the ring are going to be vibrating in space. And whether they're involved in hydrogen bonds or free in solution, they're going to vibrate at different frequencies. 
And so this is how the resonance Raman experiment works. We excite the sample with light in the Sora Ray region, and we try to pick up those vibrations. <clears throat> and when we do that, we were able to generate this trace, trace here. And I'd like to thank Dr. Tang from David Boshin's group for actually making this measurement for us. Uh, from this experiment, these stretching frequencies are, are known quite well to exist from the methine bridge stretching frequency, so that's this group here, and it indicates that all of the bacterial chlorophylls are penta-coordinated. So you get four coordinations from the nitrogens, and then a fifth from some other light. In addition to that, it shows that the C3 acetyl groups, which are located here, are involved in hydrogen bonds, as well as the 13-1 keto groups, which are down here. We can again go back to the literature and compare this to LH1 and LH2, which we have structures for, and when we compare that to LH1, we can see that there's great agreement between uh, what I call the bound three acetyl groups. Uh, and it's actually quite a bit dissimilar from LH2 complexes from um, Rhodopseudomonas acidophila. So what does that mean? Well, because we have structures of both LH1 and LH2, there's actual consequences for that. And that's how the hydrogen bonding network is between LH1 and LH2. For example, in LH2, the hydrogen bonds to those three acetyl groups come from this tyrosine and this tryptophan, which are loca located towards the C-terminus from the centrally coordinating histamine residue. And this cartoon on the left shows how those hydrogen bonds uh, interact. We have each alpha subunit binding those three acetyl groups from two bacterial chlorophylls, which are not in the same subunit. So if this is one subunit here, the hydrogen bond is to one of the bacterial chlorophylls, and the second one is to the adjacent protomer. The case is fundamentally diff different for LH1, where the hydrogen bonds come from these tryptophan residues and from the alpha and beta subunit, in that they're internal to each one of the building blocks for the antenna. When we align again the rosia flexus sequence, we see that these residues which are responsible for the hydrogen bonds are conserved between rosia flexus and LH1 complexes. This would certainly give rise to the resonance Raman spectrum which we were able to uh, measure. So now I'd like to talk about how can we determine how many subunits comprise the antenna. And one way which we can do this is to use pigment extraction followed by HPLC. Uh, experiments like this I think were originally started by Koyama and Ahmes had done them and they've been done more recently as well. As I mentioned earlier, we can purify the reaction center separately from the core complex. In the reaction center, there are three bacterial chlorophyll A and three bacterial pheophyton A molecules. Pheophytons are chlorophylls without their central metal. If we assume that there's one reaction center in n number of subunits in the antenna, then we could say that we would expect the core complex of the LHRC to have three of those pheophyton molecules three of the bacterial chlorophyll molecules from the reaction center, and then three in each subunit times n number of subunits. You can relate these two, uh, you can relate these two expressions simply uh, by a ratio of their integrated absorbances from the elution profile of the extracted pigments. So on the bottom left, we can clearly see that we can separate bacterial field fighting from bacterial chlorophyll. And if we integrate this ratio underneath each one of these peaks, uh, then we can solve these two equations for n. And when we do that, from several different extractions, in fact, six for the LHRC and three for the reaction center, we come up with 15 plus or minus one subunits in the antenna. And so after that, I definitely wanted to check whether that would be a rational number or not. And so with the help of one of Neil Hunter's students, or uh, postdocs, uh, we were able to use three complexes from purple bacteria in which we know their subunit composition. This is the LH, this is the um, core complex, the dimeric form from Rhodobacter sevoides, its monomer counterpart, as well as the monomer from uh, Ruru. We know how many subunits comprise each one of these complexes, as well as their approximate mass. And when we ran high resolution gel filtration and compared their elution times, we were able to see that there's a very similar elution time between the monomeric forms of each of these core complexes and the rosy flexus castor core complex, 
Uh, and the number of subunits in each one of these antenna complexes are similar, either 15 plus or minus one as we proposed, as well as 16 for these other cases. On the right, these are um, images generated from EM where you can actually count the number of subunits in each one of these complexes. So let's put together an antenna model of, of what I would expect the LHRC from Rosia Flexus to look like. From the biochemistry, I would expect that there would be 15 plus or minus one subunits surrounding the reaction center. And that in each one of these subunits, I'd expect to find three bacteriochloropha molecules here in green are the B880 pigments and in yellow, excuse me, are the 800 nanometer pigments. The B880 pigments are going to be very LH1-like, as we would say, just from the primary sequence as well as the resonance Raman. And that the hydrogen bonds to these bacterial chlorophylls we would expect to be internal to each of the alpha beta pairs. That's indicated here by these red arrows. Uh, and lastly, kind of the anomaly in this complex is how the B800 nanometer pigment is oriented at a large angle. And that's indicated here in yellow. So we had this model, I think, around Christmas time of uh, last year. And I had heard about the Park Scientific Exchange Program, uh, which is a, a very awesome thing. And I think everyone should, should participate in it if they can. Um, the Scientific Exchange Program through Park allowed me to visit the laboratory of Neil Hunter uh, in, this, in this picture here uh, for a couple of weeks and using his expertise in AFM and EM to try to build a higher resolution model for the LHRC. These are some of his research associates who I had the pleasure of working with when I was there. This is Pete Adams and Dr. John Olson. And our exper experimental approaches to use while we were there uh, were AFM of the native membrane. We were gonna try to crystallize the purified complex and then investigate that with either cryo-EM or AFM. And lastly, uh, single particle analysis. Much of this work is still ongoing, but I would like to share with you uh, the results, or some of the results from our single particle analysis. I would like to pause and also thank Dr. Chan for helping me with these experiments. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with him as well. He's also a member of uh, Dr. Hunter's group. On the top panel, which is labeled A, this is just a negative stained uh, EM image of the particles themselves. And we were quite happy when we saw this to see in the green box a, uh, sort of elliptical or circular shaped complexes. And in the red box I show you what looks like side projections of this complex lying on its side. Uh, you can use software then to pick all these particles out. We'd like to average them to try to gain a higher resolution uh, projection of the complex. And just for comparative purposes, I'll include what the LH only antenna looks like. So in this case, we have do primarily donuts. So the reaction center, which we presumed was in the middle, was now lost. And many of the complexes actually seem to only form uh, half circles, or yeah, half circular structures, as you can see here in red. Uh, this might be more clear in the uh, picked particles. But going through and um, using some software to align these particles, we actually generated a series of projections. And that's them, uh, these are those projections here. On the top row, we have the LH only, and on the bottom, we have the LHRC. And we can separate these into what we think are, are different views. A view with, into the periplasmic side, or the periplasmic face of the complex uh, facing out of the uh, board here. A side view, and then one uh, for the cytoplasmic view. Uh, from this, we can very clearly see in the side projection uh, some electron density, which was, some density which was sticking out of the complex. We think, this is almost undoubtedly the C subunit from the reaction center, which is protruding, would be protruding into the periplasmic space. That's responsible for this light region that we see here in what we call the periplasmic view. <clears throat> so we can kind of cut out the uh, side view and get some dimensions for the complex. We measured the height of the complex to be about 115 angstroms. Uh, with the C subunit, if we account for the lack of the C subunit, it's about 70, and it has a width of about 130 angstroms. These values are a little bit inflated when you compare them to what's known from LH1 core complexes that other people have measured. However, in the detergent solubilized complex, I would suspect that the detergent itself would add to the effective diameter in which we measure. So any hydrophobic portion of this complex is going to have a belt of detergent molecules interacting with it, which I think would increase this diameter. 
We've also played around with uh, inserting some electron density from systems in which we know uh, the crystal structure. For, exa for example, the Viridis Reaction Center. If we take the Viridis Reaction Center and stick it into this complex, it actually fits quite nicely if we remove the C subunit, which, I mean the H subunit, I apologize, which would be sitting on the top. In addition to that, we can also start to put in the pigment molecules, which we measured from the uh, linear dichroism and their angles, and start to get a view of what this complex looks like in the absence of a high resolution, uh, say, crystal structure. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and I'd like to conclude with some observations that we gained from this project. Um, for example, we sh I've shown you a model of the LHRC where I really feel the uh, B880 pigments are very similar to what's found in LH1. We have this unusual pigment absorbing at 800 nanometers which appears to be oriented at a large angle. Uh, the complex uses a variety of carotenoid molecules. But we think the estimate of about 15 plus or one, plus or minus one subunits uh, may be valid. So we can ask ourselves some questions. If LH1 doesn't have an additional pigment at 800 nanometers, well, what would be the purpose of having this pigment there then? And we have to remember that most species of FAPs contain a chlorosome, which is sitting closest to that 800 nanometer absorbing pigment. And orientation measurements of the base plate complex, which couples the chlorosome to the membrane, Estimate that this comp that the bacteria chlorophyll A is about 55 degrees with respect to the normal of the membrane. So having a pigment oriented at about 45 degrees within the membrane is probably a good compromise for receiving excitation from the chlorosome and getting it to the 880 nanometer pigments, where it can then be used to transfer to the reaction center. And of course, we still have some unanswered questions with this project, such as uh, how are the LHRC complexes distributed in the membrane? These were the AFM attempts that I did during the park exchange, and they're still ongoing. And lastly, um, what could we learn from the kinetics of energy transfer within the antenna itself? So I'd like to thank many people who made this project possible. Uh, first, my advisor, Bob Blankenship, for allowing me to work on a very interesting project, as well as all the members of the Blankenship Lab who've heard me talk about Rosie Flexus for the past three and a half years. And I'm sure they're all happy they won't have to in a couple months. Uh, from UC Riverside, I'd really like to appreciate Dr. Boshin and his research associate, Dr. Tang, for the resonance Raman data, as well as from my park exchange in the laboratory of Neil Hunter and all of his associates, Dr. Chen Olson and Pete Adams, for their help and companionship when I was uh, across the pond, and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Questions for Aaron? Have at least one question from our electronic partners. Is that right, Rachel? <clears throat> Maybe go ahead and start with that one. Okay. Um, so, John Lindsay had a question about your excitation spectra. Does the BCHL a B band contribute fully just as the QY band? It wasn't clear what the absorption in the B band region. Uh, it wasn't clear what extent the B region absorption was due to the B band and what was due to the carotenoids. I see you should Oh, yeah, so the question was about the Saray band contribution to the excitation profile, if I understand the question correctly. Um, we don't actually, in that, I won't go back to it, but uh, it's actually not included the Saray band contributions uh, from that profile. They occur primarily below 400 nanometers for the uh, V transitions, and so they're probably not going to contribute to what we see from the carotenoid. I think the two are exclusive. I got another question related to the carotenoids. You said you saw some differences um, when you're preparing the bacteria in different sort of conditions. Yeah. So that leads you to uh, think of these as sort of a structural function or more of like a, you know, um, so the question was, uh, what we feel the role of the carotenoids are in the complex due to the fact that there seems to be a broad distribution of them, whether we grow the organism anaerobically or aerobically. And unfortunately, we, I don't think we can say with, with certainty 
uh, their role, only that it doesn't appear they appear to be very good at transferring excitation. Um, due to the similarity that we see between LH1 and LH2, I could hypothesize that they would serve certainly a structural role, but I don't have much evidence to support that. So we had a question about uh, circular dichroism, which I did not present. Uh, but all of the experiments we did them on were purified complexes. Yeah, the linear dichroism was also. But you can do that on membranes as well. It's actually even easier to do it on membranes. The H bond assignments for the TRPS and LH1 came from site directed mutants. Mm -hmm. um, just say it. <laughs> Sephiroid, just not Sephiroides. Sephiroides. Yeah. I thought he had a question, he was just a comment. Okay. <laughs> So Neil's comment was, in the LH1 complexes, the H bond assignments came from mutagenesis, not from structural data. And that is certainly true. I have a question about the. At the end, you were talking about the possible function of the B800 pigments and how they would, would uh, facilitate energy transfer from the quadrant. <clears throat> of course, rosiflexus doesn't, or from the horizontal, sorry. Uh, of course, rosiflexus doesn't contain a chlorophyll, and so that argument would only apply if they were both rosiflexus and chloroflexus were descended from an organism that did contain a chlorophyll. So, do you think that that suggests that the ancestor was a chlorophyll-containing organism, and that rosiflexus has lost the chlorophyll? All right, so, so Bob's question, for those who might not have heard it, are some, some of our are most interesting from group eating, and they uh, involve evolution. So the question is whether uh, rosiaflexus ever contained, the ancestor of rosiaflexus and chloroflexus, whether it contained chlorosomes or not. So you could imagine that either the ancestor did not contain chlorosomes, and chloroflexus-like species obtained chlorosomes somehow, maybe through lateral gene transfer, or that the descendant of both of them contained chlorosomes, and rosiaflexus simply lost it. I would, if I had just guessed, I would favor the latter. Yeah, that would be the case. Yeah. So I have a sort of related question. Um, in nature, do you find rosiaflexus ever sort of growing on its own, or is it always growing in symbiosis or adjacent to chloroflexus and the other guys that uh, to my understanding, it's primarily found growing with cyanobacteria. Um, maybe not always growing with chloroflexus. The cyanobacteria almost certainly provide most of their uh, carbon sources. Because rosiaflexus is not uh, autotrophic, it needs to get inorganic carbon or organic carbon from somewhere. And it's, I think it's primarily getting it from the cyanos. So you think it's because of the carbon Yeah, that, and, and again, that's my lack of uh, microbiology, but I, I would think that. We have another thing from Neil here. Natalie passed the pronunciation to me, but I <laughs> uh, Neil says, you should be able to dissociate the LH1 into V820 type subunits. This was done for the LH2 of Molisiana. Yeah, so Neil's, Neil's question is, in LH1 complexes, you can dissociate the ring into individual building blocks which have absorption properties not quite identical to the full LH1 complex. They actually absorb around 820 nanometers. And we've tried this. Um, the only way it is partially successful is if we start with the purified polypeptides and titrate in bacteria chlorophyll. Some of the other standard methods in which others have used, it's, uh, it does not work. You credited Paul Loach. Yes, a lot of work from Paul Loach. More questions for Eric? If not, let's thank him.